Sardis was founded in the 12th century and built upon a crumbling rock at an elevation of 1500 feet and it became the capital of the Lydian Kingdom, one of the richest kingdoms of the ancient world. Coined money is reported to have been invented here. The almost perpendicular walls of the elevation on which the stronghold of the city was built made the inhabitants of the city overconfident and proud. During the reign of Croesus, one of the strongholds of the city was captured by Cyrus in 549 BC when one of his soldiers scaled the rock face at night and opened the gates to the Persians. He learned the secret route up after watching one of the guards, who had fallen asleep at his post of duty, go and retrieve his helmet that had fallen off his head. The inhabitants of the city did not learn their lesson and 300 years later suffered the same fate when Antiochus the Great captured the city. Carelessness, sleepiness and overconfidence led the city to destruction. This area that was once the bustling centre of the Lydian Kingdom now lies barren and deserted. Sardis, the city that was once alive, is now dead. The church in Sardis begins with the message, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. Like the city, the church in Sardis started with great promise, but quickly faded. No church or individual Christian can survive on past reputation, no matter how good this might have been. It was once stated that next to cowardice and treachery is overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness. Let us be wary of overconfidence, for 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. The church that had been hard-working but loveless during the time of Ephesus, that became persecuted during the time of Smyrna, was compromised in Pergamos, apostate in Thyatira, is now dead in Sardis. Historically, we take this time period to be the end of the Reformation and just after the end of the Reformation. The leaders of the Reformation were those of vigor and consecration, but over time their followers, happy with the gains that their leaders had made, settled down into organized religion. Whilst improvements had been made from the mother church that they broke away from, the movements of Knox and Luther settled down into being a state religion supported by the public treasury. Even in Sardis, there was still hope. You have a few names. In fact, the name Sardis means that which remains. Despite the majority of Protestantism falling into dead formalism, there will be some who would overcome. Historically, during this time period, we see the rise of the American colonies, which formed the foundation to a new nation, providing new opportunities for the church. Those who overcome in Sardis receive perhaps the best promise of all. They will walk before me in white, and I will not blot their names out the book of life. If your spiritual life has become consumed with dead formalism, then the counsel to Sardis applies to you. Hold fast and repent. Repent of a lifeless religion of forms, routine and monotony, and pray for renewal. Those who overcome in Sardis would be clothed in white robes. The white toga in Rome was a symbol of victory and joy. This city, this church, which suffered capture due to carelessness, is told to watch. May we watch our spiritual condition, that we don't become overconfident and keep a careful eye on our relationship and our walk with God. everybody and happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there you know maybe, maybe we ought to give a dad a clap right amen good <clears throat> amen but good to see everybody praise the Lord but anyway here we are the church of Sardis and this is one that I've really been looking forward to this is the fifth church in this series of seven and as you noticed on that video there uh, this is where the most scholars believe that that was the fifth age of this church age, and it was written during the for the Reformation period. So you can see how this was all prophesied at the beginning, and now here we are. And man, in two weeks from today, we're going to be talking about the Church of Laodicea, and that's where we catch up with our age right now. And man, 
if you don't see any comparisons to what the church of Laodicea was about and what we're seeing now in the, in the Christian world. Man, it's just total, total prophecy that's come true right in front of our eyes. And so, so anyway, um, just want to show you this QR code. If you at any time want to take a picture of that with your phone, it'll lead you right directly to our website. And then if you scroll down just about half an inch, you'll see sermon notes. Or, and, and, and that's where you can click on that and you can be, go right to the U version. Uh, do that every week and you'll stay right up to date on what we're talking about. And uh, so here we are, though, with this dead church. And I want to jump right into this thing. Because there's going to be one key verse that we're going to see throughout the morning. And that's when uh, Jesus said, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You know what I think about when I hear that verse? I think about zombie church. Yeah, you know, in 1968 was the very first zombie movie. That was high-tech stuff back in 1968, The Night of the Living Dead. Has anybody ever watched that? Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? I mean, seriously. And matter of fact, let me read to you a few um, bullet points of people that have graded this movie. It says, it was a typical gross-out movie complete with flesh-eating zombies and a horrible storyline. That's what it says. And number two, the zombies were dead, but they moved about as if they were still alive. And then the third one said, it's almost as if somebody forgot to tell them that their lives had come to an end. So here we are, Father's Day 2022, and I have my list of bad dad jokes. But this time they're dedicated to zombies, since we're talking about the dead church. So, and these are easy, man. I think in the first service, out of seven of these, I think five were answered by somebody in the congregation. So here you go, guys. Here's your chance to be, to be somebody on Father's Day 2022. What streets do zombies live on? Yes, dead ends. <laughs> okay, not burnt ends like we get at Smitty's, but dead ends, right? Okay, good deal. What, what vehicles do zombies drive? Monster trucks, all right? And then, what makeup do zombies wear? Well, they do. It's called mascara. <laughs> oh, man, that's a good one, wasn't it? Okay, check this one out. Oh, okay. What brand of underwear do zombies wear? Fruit of the tomb. <laughs> I don't know how I missed that one in the first service. I didn't even tell that one. Okay, check this one out. Here's an easy one, guys. Where do zombies go for beach holidays? The Dead Sea. Yeah. Okay, two more. You got two more chances. Where do fashionable zombies shop? Aber Zombie and Finch. Okay, okay, one more. This is the good one. Where do zombies go sailing? No, Lake Erie. I tried to help, guys. Tried to make you feel good about stuff. But anyway, here we are talking about, you know, the dead church. And in the first service, Jack Watson was uh, one of our lay leaders this morning. And he uh, had this shovel up there for his devotion. And I thought, man, this is going to fit right in. And I'm not going to tell you what his devotion was, but his devotion, when, it, when I saw the shovel, I thought, man, Jesus said we've got a dead church, but most of the time when we have something dead, we go ahead and take a shovel, we dig a hole, we put what's in it, we cover it up, and that's how we move on. But in this story of this dead church, Jesus gives them another chance. I don't have to get the shovel out yet if you will do a few things that's causing you uh, to be dead. But see, the, the, the thing about this, these, uh, this dead church story, in our world today, this is happening to churches across America. Yes, it is. And I know a lot of times it's hard to believe. And I'm a church person. I love the church. I think our world is suffering due to the decline of the local church. Less people are being saved. Less people are being taught morals. Less people are taught the Bible. And now we see it out there on the decisions we make in our world. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a church person, but I think this is actually happening to churches in our world. And you might say, why are things like this happening even today in the life of the local church? Well, it's because churches are going through the motions. 
we're sticking keys in the door at 9 o'clock and 10.30 every Sunday morning to open up and say, y'all come. But then when we get inside there and we hear something and we leave, we don't do anything else about it until 10.30 the next Sunday morning. And, and then we say all the right things. And by all appearances, people on the outside look at us like we are really alive. And, uh, and, and we might perhaps be experiencing spiritual death. I teach a seminar in some of my consulting work called The Autopsy of a Dying Church. If you'll show, show that up, The Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And the gentleman that wrote this book, it's a great resource, by the way. It's just a little thin book, and it's just got some stuff in there compiled over the last 20 years of churches that have closed down and why they closed down and all the answers they got back. Let me read to you real quickly the four answers that comes back. Number one is slow erosion. A church dies because they erode slowly. You know what happens when things erode slowly? You never notice it. It just, you know, you just, it just looks, looks almost the same as it did last week. You know? and then, but the foundation is crumbling, and then they start eroding, and it's slow. And over a period of time, they have to die. And then the past is our hero, is number two. It, it, it's, um, it, it's when we, we remember all the great things of the past, but we forget, in reality, this is 2022, and there are people out there that are dying and going to hell when they die without Christ, and we, it's not 1979 anymore. So the past is our hero. And then the next thing is sometimes we forget whose church it really is. It's not our church. It's not my church. It's not any lay leader's church. It's not a Sunday school teacher's church. It's nobody's church except it belongs to God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, is ahead of it. And, and then... Uh, we also start falling in love with the systems of the church rather than the move of the Holy Spirit. And that's why churches die. It's when they lose the spiritual fervor. And that's why Jesus wrote this to this church in Sardis 2,000 years ago. And what he says here could actually be a help to each one of us. The problem is the first thing we look at, the problem here. The verse 1 of chapter 3 says this, Write this letter to the church, in, to the angel of the church in Sardis. And it says, it says, this is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. What I like first of all here is how Jesus introduces himself this time. He says, I am the sevenfold spirit of God. And what he's saying is that on all these churches, his desire is that the Holy Spirit in all his fullness should be poured out on all seven of these churches. The Holy Spirit should be in charge. Nobody else or nothing else. And uh, we should have the fullness of power. But when Jesus comes to this Sardis church, he says something like this. Even though I've given you the resource of the Holy Spirit, we've still got a problem here. We've got a big problem. So what is the problem? The problem, number one, is reputation versus reality. In other words, they are not what everybody thinks. They are not what everybody thinks, or they are not who everybody thinks they are. I read a story several years ago about the former football coach for the Alabama Crimson Tide, Bear Bryant. Anybody ever heard of Bear Bryant? All right, if you've heard of Bear Bryant, by the way, uh, next door is the Galloway family home, all right? Bear Bryant sat on that front porch before drinking iced tea, all right? Because he was out here coaching and he was recruiting, Sam, uh, not Sam Galloway, Benny Galloway to play football for the University of uh, Alabama. To, I mean, matter of fact, uh, old Mr. Galloway, before he passed away, told me, he said, you know, Bear Bryant took us out to Greenville and took us out to a nice restaurant and Wined and dined us, paid for our meal, and, and before we ever got in the car, um, Benny looked at him and said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm still going to the University of South Carolina. And uh, so, uh, you know, he said, we got a good meal out of the deal, though. I said, that's great. But what I, what I learned about Bear Bryant was Bear Bryant was a, was a fantastic duck hunter. He loved hunting ducks. So he, was, he had this dead eye, but then as he got older, his eyesight got worse, and he started missing ducks all the time. But you know how it is when we are good at something and now we're starting not to be, we, we're the last ones to realize that. So on one of his last duck hunts, he went out there with a bunch of guys and, and the ducks were, uh, take, took off and Bear Bryant brought up his gun first and shot a fire shot and not a duck went down, every duck just kept on flying. And you know what Bear Bryant said? 
He said, boys, looky there. He said, right there, you're seeing a miracle. There flies a bunch of dead ducks right there. I mean, in his mind, he shot them. He was the only one that, that didn't realize it. See, see that, that's, he thought he was still the best duck hunter on the planet. And, um, but see, there was a big gap between his reputation and the reality of his current situation. And that's what Jesus said the church of Sardis had. They had a reputation for being alive, but you're the only ones that don't know it. You're dead. And, uh, and that's what happens, though, when a church does not take its time and do a gut check now and then and find out exactly what we're really doing. What, what are we here for? What's our purpose? Are our ministries, are they really reaching people that Jesus wants us to reach? Or are they just ministries that help us inside and they're for us and me and my three and, and all that? And see what happens, it's so easy for a church to hang their hat on past accomplishments and past blessings and a time of revival that was experienced a long time ago. And I love church history. I love hearing about what happened in the past. I love hearing about what happened during the Reformation period. I love hearing about what happened in 1947. But in reality, this is 2022. We cannot be interested so much in what happened in the yesterdays. We have to be focused on what God wants this church to do now. Or if not, then we are a dying, if not a dead church. Amen? And so... Um, so that's why that book, you know, The Autopsy of a Deceased Church, spends a lot of time about the past being our hero. So we need to move beyond what God, what was the past, and into the glorious future with God. And so what we have to do, though, we have to constantly reevaluate. And I love this word at this time in my life right now, 58 years old. Reevaluate where we've come from, where we are where we are going, and reevaluate what we've been called to do. Are we accomplishing what God wants us to do? And, and what do we need to change in order to become greater than we've ever been before on those things that God desires? But you know, one thing that's really baffled me a lot about the church, and once again, I'm a church person. I'm not a person that's going to go out here and run the church down, diss the church, throw the church under the bus. The church is bad. The church is this. I know there are hypocrites everywhere you go. They're, you'll find them in businesses, restaurants. You'll find them in the church too. I get all of that. And I'm a church person. I love the church, and the church is helpful to our world. But one thing that has always baffled me about the church, I think we waste so much precious time on, is when we get together in small circles and, and, we, and we say things like this. Boy, I tell you what, this world is in bad shape. Look at the shape this world's in. I'll be honest with you, I believe it. But I am not going to waste all of my days that I have remaining talking about the shape that this world's in. And here's one reason why. One reason why, because it's been in bad shape ever since Adam and Eve sinned. And then brothers started killing brothers. Homosexuals started popping out of the closet during, during the early ages. And we're not the first ones that's ever seen this. So what, what I'm saying is that, is that rather than me sit around and in our little peer groups talking about how bad this world is in, the shape it's in, I think my recourse, the only recourse I have to fix anything is to go deeper with God. It's to go deeper with Christ. And say, Lord, show me more about your word. Sin has always been out there. There's been crooked kings and politicians everywhere. Matter of fact, sometimes I think they were worse in the days of the kings. But what I, what I wonder sometimes, if, if I don't talk like this, just to spare me from going deeper with God, which is basically the best thing I can do, is to go deeper with the Lord, deeper with the word, have the Holy Spirit to come up on me in a powerful way. This past week, I was doing a devotion, and I do this every morning. It's one of those uh, on the Version app. And, and um, yeah, uh, on June the 13th, the, the devotion started out by saying this, your nation can be changed. I thought, wow, let's hear about this. Here's how the devotion started. There were 10,000 sex workers plying their trade on the streets of London. Binge drinking and gambling were widespread. 
the UK had descent, descended into decadence and immorality. This was the 18th century. Church congregations had declined sharply. Church congregations gone downhill just like today. And check this out. And it says, parts of the church had virtually descended into paganism. Yet the nation was changed. Here's how it happened. The preaching of John Wesley and George Whitfield began to take effect. Thousands of people responded to their message and encountered Jesus. They didn't just encounter Jesus. They left the church houses and they told at least 10 people the next week about this Jesus that changed them. Robert Rake started his first Sunday school in 1780. The growth from this one idea reached 300,000 unchurched children within five years. By 1910, there, there were well over 5 million children in Sunday school. God raised up William Wilberforce and others. Not only were individual hearts changed, but the nation was also transformed because people left the church and took Jesus with them wherever they went. Hallelujah. Let's give them a hand. Amen? That's the kind of church I'd like to see one day. That's the kind of church I'd like to see the Wesleyan church be. That's the kind of church I'd like to see the United Wesleyan be. We don't have time to sit around and talk about how bad. We all know how bad the world is. But my, my question for each one of us, have you told your story this week? Have you told your story about how God redeemed you this week and, and saved you from the pits of sin? Have you loved the unlovable this week? Have you served the least of these this week? And the question I've got to ask myself, am I just having a religious life or am I having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Man, if, you, if I got to choose which one I could have, a relationship with Jesus or a religious life, I'll take a relationship with Jesus every single day. Amen? And that's what we need, church. And that leads us into that next thought is religious life versus spiritual living. And see, that's, that's what I think that, that happened to this church in Sardis. They had a religious life, but they weren't living spiritual. They were living, but they were dead. The story said on November 13th, 2002, Jim Sulkers, a 53-year-old retired municipal worker from Winnipeg, climbed into bed, pulled up the covers, and died. Nearly two years later, on August 25, 2004, police, who, also, who had been called by concerned relatives, entered Sulker's apartment and found his body in a mummified state two years later. Nobody knew a thing about it. Everything else in this tidy one-bedroom apartment was intact, although the food in his fridge was spoiled and his wall calendar was two years out of date. Mr. Salker's death went undiscovered for several reasons. Number one, he was reclusive. He was estranged from family members. He had a medical condition that prevented his body from decomposing and emitting odors. In addition, automatic banking deposited his disability pension every month and withdrew utilities and other expenses as they came due. Life goes on, laying there, becoming a mummy. Money coming in, money going out. Everybody thinks things are just like normal. Well, there was a study done by New York University. And one person on that study, Terrence Moran, that studied this situation right here. That's a true story. And they said this, for many practical purposes, this man was virtually alive throughout that entire time. Everything went on just like it should have. You know what I love about that phrase? The phrase virtually alive. That intrigues me. Because you, you know what that means? It means almost, but not quite. <laughs> In other words, he was dead, but he was almost alive. He might as well have said he was alive. Everything was going on. The light bill was still being paid, everything else. And that's really close to what Jesus said to the church in Sardis. People, you think you're alive, but you're really dead. Now, how in the world could people be so fooled as to think the church was alive when it really wasn't? Well, let me, tell, let me describe to you what a successful church looks like from the outside. Well, they, they have a nice building, nice property, well manicured. They've got a guy like Andy out here mowing the fields for us every time they need mowed and all that stuff. 
They've got people that are doing things. It looks nice. You should come in here on a Sunday, manicured and, uh, and all that. And it, it looks good. Then you come in, and you're going to see a professional staff that meets people, greets people, loves people, and, um, and is there for any questions that needs answered. And, um, and we've got this good budget. We've got a huge budget. And from the outside, we look like we have the blessing of God all over us. We really do. But deep down, at the heart of the whole thing, Maybe they don't have love, real love for the lost. That's, what's a, that's what a poor church is. That's what a dying church is that does not have a real love for unsaved people. People that are dying and not going to purgatory, they're going to hell when they die. That's the only two options, heaven or hell, with Jesus or without Jesus. And so, so uh, they, we don't have a real love for the lost. We don't have compassion for the unchurched. And, uh, and, and we, might not, we might just be trying to minister to those within our own flock. Those are signs of a modern-day dying church. But on the outside, we appear to be a loving, caring community. But it's possible. Check this out, guys. This is probably not us. It's probably somebody else. But probably this church became clickish. And the only ones that they loved were themselves. That's not the kind of church I want to be a part of. And I don't think any of us do at all. But that's probably what happened. Because this church was extremely religious. They, had all, they held to all the forms of religion. And they, they got the liturgy down pat. They were an orthodox church. And at the same time, they probably would not recognize the move of the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit came and moved upon them. The church of Sardis was dying a slow death of apathy. Billy Graham preached on this church many times. And I remember one time he preached and he, was, he stopped in his sermon. He said, I want to introduce you to a man named Wilbur Smith. He said, Wilbur Smith is probably, to me, one of the greatest Bible scholars I have ever met. And during his interview of Wilbur Smith that day from a lectern in Michigan somewhere, he said, Mr. Smith, what do you think is the greatest danger in the church today in America? And Wilbur Smith said, dead orthodoxy. Dead orthodoxy. He said, what I mean by that, the church is so right... We are dead right. Man, that was a mouthful. We are so right. We are dead right. So do you think something like that could happen to us? And if something like that ever happened to us, why would it happen? Is it because we have bad buildings, a bad street presence? You know, we just things just don't look right on the outside. The shutters are the wrong paint on them and some need scraped and the beams inside just don't look well. The lights are flashing, going out. We can't replace them. Is that what makes a dead church? Well, let me tell you a, a true story again about a, a new pastor that was called to a church in Oklahoma. And um, he, he spent the first four days when he moved to that city making personal visits to all the church members. And he invited them to come to the first service next Sunday. This is a true story, by the way. Google this sometime. And the following Sunday, the church was all but empty, practically empty. So accordingly, the pastor placed a notice in the local newspaper stating that because the church was dead, it was everyone's duty to give it a decent Christian burial. And the funeral would be held the following Sunday afternoon, the notice said those words. So people were morbidly curious. I would be too. I've never been to a real church funeral before. I've helped close down several churches. We did just one in Fountain Inn, South Carolina a few weeks ago. And we sent a district ambassador, Mark Wilson, down there to do the final service. And sort of like a funeral service, you know, it's the way it works. But these people are morbidly curious. So the next Sunday afternoon, a huge crowd turned out. Had to bring out chairs from the back, you know. So, so a huge crowd turned out. And in front of the pulpit, they saw a closed coffin. It had flowers all over it, just like a normal funeral. And, um, and, they, and, and so the pastor delivered this eulogy, and then he opened the coffin, 
and he invited his congregation to come forward and to pay their final respects uh, to their dead church. And uh, so people were filled with curiosity about what the inside of a coffin would look like for a dead church. So people stood in line, they came, and as everybody came and stood in line, everybody went <clears throat> like that and turned around and left, walked off. And so the final part of the story is that in the coffin, tilted at a correct angle, was a large mirror. And that's what a dead church looks like. Dead church doesn't look bad. It's not dead because it's got bad paint and floor tiles coming up and grass not mowed. It's when people like Tim Jones looks inside that coffin and I see myself. That's what makes a dead church. People make a dead church. Churches, churches never die because the shingles are old. It dies because people lose the passion, purpose, and they lose the focus. And so, but here, here's the thing about Jesus, though. In all these churches, he never does tell them what's wrong without giving a plan on how to dig, a, dig themselves out. Without digging a hole with that shovel, he tells them what the situation is. That's when we get to the need. And I'll move through this real fast. So the need comes up in verses 2 and 3. Here's what it says. Wake up, strengthen what remains. You see that? Wake up, strengthen what remains. In other words, everything you're doing is not dead. So there's a couple things that still might work. So what I want you to do, I want you to strengthen, start right there, work on what it is you have left and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Then he said, remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So, so what he's saying here, he's saying to this church, wake up. And here's the deal. Here's, what, here's how wise Jesus was in his words. This church, if any, would understand what he's talking about. Because the city of Sardis, if you remember that video we just watched, they were caught several time, times in their history napping, and they suffered the consequences. They felt safe because they had these mountains and these hills all around Enemies could not get there unless they came up the mountains and came down and they would be caught and captured. But they went to sleep too many times thinking they were saved. So Jesus told this church to wake up and watch. He's not reminding them of their past. I mean, he's reminding them of their past and their need to not be caught napping spiritually. Don't fall asleep spiritually. Have you ever fallen asleep spiritually? Just thinking everything's all right. I went to church this morning, gave my offering, and did all that. Maybe you're here this morning because you're asleep spiritually. And see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying to wake up and let's go back to the past and remember where we used to be. Strengthen what you have. Strengthen what you've got. See, God is really well aware of our tendency to fall into a comfort zone. That I, I'll be honest with you, I fight with that. I have to be like the Apostle Paul and discipline my body, discipline myself not to get comfortable. I come out here on Father's Day, we had a great crowd of people here today, both services, praise God. But that's no need for me to fall into a comfort zone and not do what I'm called to do. Now, I will say this, that about 2 o'clock today, I'll fall into a pretty, about a two-hour comfort zone. Matter of fact, somebody asked me this morning, said that, um, are you going to, you know, the U.S. opens on the day. Are you going to take your two-hour nap? I said, well, I'll probably just take one hour. But I said, usually when I take up, just take one hour, I wake up grouchy. I said, but you know what? This time, I think I'll just let her sleep. And so, yeah. I told that to three people this morning, so now a whole crowd of people. But you know, it's easy to fall into our comfort zone, isn't it? It's easy to fall into our comfort zone when it comes to our faith. So Jesus reminds us to be aware of what is taking place at all times. See, the gospel is too powerful and too important to fall into complacent hands. And so that slide that you're seeing up there, 
This is another seminar that I, I haven't done this in a while, but I'm planning on doing this in sometime before this year's over. Is this bucket represents eight different areas of church growth, church life, ministry, worship, structures, spirituality, evangelism, uh, some other things around there. But when you hand out 100 questions to all the congregation about their life in the church, what will come back are the results that I send in. And this company comes back and says, this one right here is your weakest link. Matter of fact, when we did this at United probably 10 years ago, it was evangelism was our weakest link. And you know what happens if you put water in that bucket? Where's it going to come out? It's going to come out where the lowest board is, and that's evangelism. So we teach, take your weakest structure and work on that and build it up. The reason I wanted to show that, Jesus says just the opposite. Because this is trying to fix what's leaking. Jesus says, if you want to go forward and recapture, then I want you to take what's really working in your life right now, and I want you to strengthen it and move into the future and all these other things. They may catch up, but at least you're doing one thing really well. And, and so that's what he was talking about. So I want to list three questions, and I want to just throw these out there real quick. We're almost finished. And, 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 um, and look at this yourself. And this will probably give you an idea if you are complacent without anybody else judging you. You just judge yourself. Are you aware of the unchurched all around you, and are you doing something about it? If I can say, no, I'm really not a, aware of that, then it's time for me to wake up because Jesus is perfectly aware of it. And then the second thing, are we seeing people who are unloved and uncared for or going out of our way to love and care for them? If not, then it's time for me to wake up because I believe that we're called here, we're put on this earth to experience the love of Jesus and to show it to other people. And then the third thing is if I'm asleep at the wheel when it comes to being in tune with God's plan, with God's purpose and God's directives in his word, it might be time for me to wake up. So if you could just answer those questions yourself, where do you fit in? And once again, it's not the brick and mortar that makes a dying church. It's people like me that makes a dying church. When I am not bought in to these things that God wants us to focus on. In my office at home, I have a little picture on the wall that says these words. You never change your life until you step out of your comfort zone. Change begins at the end of your comfort zone. And I'm just wondering this morning if maybe some of us, are we in a comfort zone? It's easy to get in a comfort zone in the United States of America. It really is. We still live in the best nation in the world, the most influential nation in the world. It's easier to experience the dream probably in our country than it is a lot of other places. So it's easy to fall into a comfort zone. So let me ask you four thoughts real quickly. What about your prayer life? Is prayer the engine or the caboose of your, prayer, of, of your spiritual life? What about, your, what about discipleship, living for Christ each day? Is that important? Number three, what about the necessity of faith? Faith in everyday life. Do you know that the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God? And what about the gospel, the urgency of the gospel? You see, the Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Do you realize when people are sharing the gospel and people receive it, this world becomes a better place to live because now people make better moral decisions? If that's not happening in a declining church, guess what? All those millions and billions of people out there aren't hearing the gospel and the transforming life that Christ offers. Now, we make decisions based on what we know inside. So this world is suffering because of dead churches like Sardis. Let this not be us. Amen? Let this not be your family. Let this not be your personal life. Men, I'm calling you on uh, all of us, join together on Father's Day 2022. Let us do what we need to do to make our society as strong and spiritual as possible and our families 
Let's help them become strong and spiritual. And let's come into our church. Play your role. Do your part. And be that component that God wants you to be. So this was the church at Sardis. And I hope that we continue to grow. And I hope that if you look in that symbolic casket, that you don't see yourself in that mirror. Because what makes churches die is not the bricks and mortar, but people like me, people like us. Let's all stand. The worship team's coming this morning, and we're going to give glory to God and, and praise Him. But I'd like for you to bow your heads in prayer first this morning. Just want to thank God for all of you that's here this morning, taking time out of your busy Father's Day weekend to be with your family, to be with your church family, and ultimately to worship the God that redeems you. God, I want to thank you for your mercy and grace to all of us. I want to thank you, Lord, for all the uh, men in this congregation. I pray from this day forward that all of us will together want to make our community, our families, and our church the greatest, let it be the greatest generation because of our faithfulness to you. And Father, this morning, if there's anybody here that has never made a commitment to receiving you as their Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that that person, Lord, will right now ask Jesus into their heart to save them from their sin. And Father, I would love to have a just a brief conversation with them right after the service. So God, if that would, if you could make that happen, Lord, piece all that together for us. God, bless those that make a new commitment. Bless us as we sing. Let us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray.